We work in uh, basically in South Indian states as well as Varissa and to a little extent in Maharashtra. And our issue has been now democratizing the genetic engineering debate. Let me start at the global level. In the global level, the biggest users of genetic engineering is the United States of America, followed by Argentina, Canada, and uh, to some extent China. We even we have come into that bandwagon now. We are one of the five, six uh, countries who are using genetic engineering. Now, genetic engineering claims two or three things. One is costs come down for the farmers, yields increase, and far, farmers start making benefits. Now let's take the question of yields, which is one of the biggest that our policy makers catch hold of. We have to get into nuclear uh, energy because it gives us lots of power. We have to get into genetic engineering because through that we can increase our yields manifold. Now on yields, the United States Department of Agriculture put up certain studies on its own website. The studies were done by the Cornell University of the United States, one of the most uh, reputed universities. It has looked at the yield of genetically engineered um, corn, maize, and genetically engineered soya over a period of 10 years. These were the 10 years that corresponds to the entry and growth of genetic engineering in the United States. At the end of these 10 years, the result is there have been two bushels per acre less in the genetically engineered soybean compared to uh, non-genetically engineered soybean. So because BT cotton, BT is a, is a kind of a genetically engineered cotton which addresses only one pest called helicoverla. Whereas cotton has a family of pests which attack it. And it is the law of nature that if you suppress one pest, the other pest take over. Therefore, when the helicoverpa was brought down, the other pests like thrips, sucking pests, aphids, etc., they completely overtook the crop. And therefore, in the total uh, pest family, the other pest came. I mean, it's not just our experience. I have cross-checked this in uh, South Africa with the scientists there who are studying BT cotton. Indonesia, I have looked at it in Mali and Burkina Faso in Africa, generally the southern part of the globe. And everywhere this is the same thing. You, you, you target one family of pests, the other family of pests take over. Therefore, farmers have to per se apply pesticides. The new pesticides were less in volume. This is a very interesting thing. Therefore, if the industry comes to you and tells you that the pesticide use has come down, it only talks about the volumes of pesticide. But the new pesticides were so strong that you can use less pesticides for the same effect. But their costs were much higher. So we have looked at the costs of the pesticides. They have not come down in all these five years. And thirdly, the farmers get higher yield. No farmer got a higher yield. Even in the United States, the famous Cornell University study I was referring to, there also, I have told you that only two uh, bushels uh, less. When this study was taken to the chief of Monsanto, he was very categoric. He said, genetic engineering will not increase yields. It will it will solve other problems, but not yield increase. But somehow, our scientific community and with its Mukota, the mask, Mr. Prime Minister of this country, hide this from us. They will always talk about increasing yields. And uh, um, so these, these two, I'm, 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 I'll end this because we can come back to this discussion later. The third point I want to make is, what are the other effects it has? Number one, soils have become extremely toxic. And it is not our fault. We first, when we found it, we were thrilled. But as usual, we were not confident about our findings. Well, what, what our findings said, in the first year after the harvest of BT cotton, 2% of the soils 
suffered from a disease called root rot disease. Rhizotomia is a scientific word for that. What it means is there is toxicity beginning in the soil. By fifth year, it went up to 40 percent. So within five years, 40 percent of the soils were gone. I also introduced myself as the national intervener of a uh, network called Southern Action and Genetic Engineering. We are uh, five years old now. We work in uh, basically in South Indian states as well as Orissa and to a little extent in Maharashtra. And our issue has been now democratizing the genetic engineering debate. Because we think that the genetic engineering debate has confined itself both at the government level and at some places in the national What is happening? Not only to the EU, but also the whole ecosystemic problems that has come to. And let me start at the global level. In the global level, the biggest users of genetic engineering is the United States of America, followed by Argentina, Canada, and uh, to some extent China. We even if we have come into that bandwagon now, we are one of the five, six uh, countries who are using genetic engineering. Now, genetic engineering claims two or three things. One is costs come down for the farmers, yields increase, and uh, farmers start making benefits. Now let's take the question of yields, which is one of the biggest that our policy makers catch hold of. We have to get into nuclear uh, energy because it gives us lots of power. We have to get into genetic engineering because through that we can increase our yields manifold. Now on yields, the United States Department of Agriculture put up certain studies on its own website. The studies were done by the Cornell University of the United States, one of the most uh, reputed universities. It has looked at the yield of genetically engineered um, corn, maize, and genetically engineered soya over a period of 10 years. These were the 10 years that correspond to the entry and growth of genetic engineering in the United States. And at the end of these 10 years, the result is there have been two bushels per acre less in the genetically engineered soybean compared to uh, non-genetically engineered soybean. So number one, so we need to I'll also come to the Indian part. The second, no, because BT cotton, BT is a chemical, it's a kind of a genetically engineered cotton which addresses only one pest called helicoverla. Whereas cotton has a family of pests which attack it. And it is the law of nature that if you suppress one pest, the other pest take over. Therefore, when the helicoverpa was brought down, the other pests like thrips, sucking pests, aphids, etc., they completely overtook the crop. And therefore, in the total uh, pest family, the other pest came. I mean, it's not. Just our experience. I have cross-checked this in uh, South Africa with the scientists there who are studying BT cotton. Indonesia, I have looked at it in Mali and Burkina Faso in Africa, generally the southern part of the globe. And everywhere this is the same thing. You, you, you target one family of pests, the other family of pests take over. Therefore, farmers have to per se apply pesticides. The new pesticides, were less in volume. This is a very interesting thing. Therefore, if the industry comes to you and tells you that the pesticide use has come down, it only talks about the volumes of pesticide. But the new pesticides were so strong that you can use less pesticides for the same effect. But the costs were much higher. So, we have looked at the costs of the pesticides. They have not come down in all these five years. And thirdly, the farmers get higher yield, no farmer got a higher yield. Even in the United States, the famous Cornell University study I was referring to, there also, I have told you that only two uh, bushels uh, less. When this study was taken to the chief of Monsanto, he was very categorical. He said, 
genetic engineering will not increase yields. It will, it will solve other problems but not yield increase. But somehow our scientific community and with its Mukota, the mask, Mr. Prime Minister of this country, hide this from us. They will always talk about increasing yields. And uh, um, so these, these two, I'm, 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 I'll end this because we can come back to this discussion later. The third point I want to make is, what are the other effects it has? Number one, soils have become extremely toxic. And it is not our, we first, when we found it, we were thrilled. But as usual, we were not confident about our findings. Well, what, what our findings said, in the first year after the harvest of Bt cotton, 2% of the soils suffered from a disease called root rot disease. Rhizotomia is a scientific word for that. What it means is there is toxicity beginning in the site. By fifth year, it went up to 40%. So within five years, 40% of the soils were gone. I'm sure science, the, the chemical science has many answers. If this toxicity, you bring this chemical and suppress that toxicity. And the other thing is its effect on the cattle. The small cattle like sheep and goats started dying, feeding on the BT cotton uh, stocks. Now the Andhra Pradesh government, which was headed by a neoliberal government at that time, Telugu Nation, they looked at this phenomena. We, we brought a lot of pressure on them to do their own studies. And their studies also revealed that this was true. And what would they do? They sent an advisory to all farmers not to graze their cattle on BT cotton fields. That's all they would do. They would not address the root of the problem. And cotton fields in some of those districts are nearly 30% or 40%. And their cattle have traditionally grazed on the cotton fields at various points of time. So what will happen to the cattle? We made three groups of sheep. And one group was fed with the first generation of BT cotton called Bolgar 1. And another group was fed Bolgar 2 which is an advanced BT cotton crop. And third was fed with non-BT cotton. It's actually a selling point. One one said I was sitting, the other fellow was sitting. Very, very sad. The mistake, the, the real mistake of the government or the Prime Minister was comparing our agriculture with the American system of agriculture and then trying to learn about this. The comparison with the two incomparables, you can compare. Is it? Our poor and farmers committed suicide. So when is the comparison? There is no comparison at all. So now he says that, you know, the, I am not much bothered about blaming the you know, NGOs on that. But he made a statement there for increasing productivity, for the solution of hunger. That is what he said, which is absolutely wrong. GM I think he should try to understand what it is. Alpha, we have seen it also through the movies now. It's not a big thing at all. So whether we should go for such an expensive thing that is the first question. Here, what they do is, is totally against organic evolution. No biologist, what the name, will work. We will have to submit to the market. So what they have done, they have taken the gene responsible for uh, you know that uh, firefly, the gene which is responsible for shining the firefly, they have taken that gene and introduced it to mango. Uh, so it becomes a uh, uh, very beautiful. But where is the science here? And the gene from the fish is taken and put onto the tomato. So uh, how can we call it a science? It is not science at all, not government. There should be a lot of it. They should be appreciated. In a democratic country, they say that if anyone speaks against the biotechnology policy of uh, the government of India, he can be arrested and jailed and also put uh, financial pieces fine. 
Such a thing, I mean, the independent media probably the first, from first time we are hearing about those things. Again, opposing the biotechnology, uh, the biotechnology, they will be crushed. This is what he said. See the attitude. See the attitude. And how the people, the farmers of the country, were uh, doing the farming, so much except everybody. Now we are seeing the movies also, how taxi it is. Okay. So, Beautifully calculated. The whole thing has come. It conveys the message. Somehow, if we can scream to the Prime Minister of India, that would be great. Whether it would work with him, I do not know. But I think he has not seen the reality. He plays only with the figures as an economist. Nothing more than that. He is not relating them with the people and the farmers. The problem is that. I don't know whether you have touched the soil at any time in his life. I don't think. So unless you go into the into the field, work with the farmers, you will not know what is happening. See, I was not a farmer at all. I was a bread person and I was doing it. Uh, my life was so beautiful, very nice. I had no problem. I was in the forest most of the time. But when I, <laughs> when I came to Kerala State University Board, then by then I realized the problem of uh, uh, pesticides in the uh, if you want to commit suicide, you take this fish 250 grams every day. Right? But if you want to have a slow death, take 250 grams once in a week. 